What's up, everybody? How you doing, man? Welcome to LA Times. We thank you for coming in today. Man, we, we welcome you. Today we got a special thing that we've never done on this channel. Ever done. I've been wanting to do, but just had to wait for the right timing, the right people to come across our path to do it. And it's going to be a topic that uh, is very important in this day because the, the topic we're going to touch on is very forsaken in a lot of ways in today's culture. But it's very important in God's eyes, you know, as God ordained it. So let's talk about it in a second. Man, I want to welcome Patrick and Donna Lee to the show. Hey, Hello, Pablo and everybody. God bless, God bless you. you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So before we get going, guys, please take a second to hit the thumbs up on this down below. Hit the thumbs up. Hit the subscribe, you know, so you could be involved a part of the channel. And also... Hit that notification bell. It reminds you of next videos coming out of when we drop something and, you know, to be reminded. But today we want to talk to you especially about relationship. And Donna Lee and Patrick, who married a lifer, somebody doing life in prison. And I'm going to talk about it for a second, then I'll pass it over. Um, for those of you who don't know, you can see Patrick. I'll put his interview down here i interviewed patrick and uh patrick has a very awesome testimony of uh he was involved in a you know a couple of shootings and he was involved in a 187 that occurred in prison did a lot of years a lot of lot, lot of years had at the time patrick got arrested there was nobody getting out who was a lifer no one getting out so what we have now is eventually Patrick, through all these years, found a wife, and they started seeing each other in prison, right? And normal, the normal person out there would be like, what are you doing? Why would you marry somebody in prison? But here's the thing, the whole point of this episode is that when God's calling two people together, you know, it, 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 it's God, and you know, and he'll work it, you know, he'll work it, and you'll see the fruit of the relationship. So without further ado, man, I want to introduce Patrick and, and Donna Lee. But if you each of you could take a second or two to tell us a quick rundown of your life and where and how you grew up, just uh, just really quick. You want to start, honey? Okay. okay. Um, I was I was born in uh, Bayshore, Long Island, New York, and raised up in Brentwood. I'm the youngest of thirteen. Uh, my beloved mother, Carmen, is Hispanic from Aguascaliente, and my father is from the British West Indies. His name was Emson, and uh, yes. Some kind of experiences did you have, like, growing up, and as you tried to work working to develop your sense of who you are, what kind of things did you face? Well, I was, uh, my neighborhood was, like, mi middle class, and um uh, they were mostly white people, so it was at a very early age when um, I experienced prejudice, and I was called the N-word, um, and also being called a spic, because my mother was Hispanic and my father had that deep Jamaican accent. And um, But my mother, she raised us up, uh, she allowed us to go into the, the Church of the Nazarene in Bayshore, and uh, it's when I come to know the Lord and um, somewhat I was, you know, introduced to our Heavenly Father and, and how much he loves us. And that was the beginning from, and that started in my preschool. And I left the church probably around, well, I stopped going to the church like around 13, when I was 13 years old. Cool. Before we go on uh, to Patrick, uh, when could you say that you knew you were born again and you received God? See the Lord. For me, there was a distinct moment in June of 1981 in my cell. And Donna? It was in 2007 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Wow. Wow, man. That's, that's cool. And Aguas Calientes, is that in Mexico? Yes. I, I, I just know my mother is from Aguas Calientes. Yeah, I, I asked because on my DNA, you know, ancestry DNA, one of the places it says my ancestors are from is Aguascalientes. So that's cool. Oh. <laughs> hey. yeah. She was raised up in Jersey. Yeah. All right. 
All right, Patrick, your turn, brother. Tell us a little about yourself, man. Yeah, I was born in Fresno in 1957. And two years after that, my sister Pamela was born. But my birth mother and father, things were not working out so well with them. And I rarely recall ever seeing them together. So I bounced around to different homes in different states. I was always well taken care of. I want to emphasize that. Never experienced child abuse but grew up without my parents being together until in 1965 my father met a really wonderful woman named mary ellen in gardnerville not too far from carson city and after they married he my father sent for me to be flown out from pennsylvania to live with my new family now with a mom a dad and my sister pam my youngest sister rhonda and my brother Todd, whom we always call Buster. So I was able to have the benefit of growing up with a not a perfect, but a nurturing and protective, stable nuclear family. And I grew, uh, ended up, we ended up in 1966, moving to Orange County. And those were the years in which I matured and began to drift away from all the, uh, uh, my, my life, I had a lot of good opportunities, but I declined that and chose the way of rebellion and that's all the disaster came about with me yeah what what year did you get arrested on this uh for ya i got arrested in december 1975 for going to adult prison i was arrested in may of 1979 and 79 is when you stayed for the long stretch right right from went yeah. in at 21 and came out at 61. cool yeah man so so he goes in and uh he picks up a 187, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a murder, you know, and we already talked about that. See the story down below, but the, here's what we're getting to, the beautiful part. You know, we've gone through all the prison journey and we touched on it, but we want to hear how God brought you guys together, how you knew, how it was done. So if you guys, you guys could start sharing on that, that would be cool, man. Sure. And uh, beloved, if you want to start, I, I do want to say neither one of us were searching. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So from your, your angle, honey, how did it come about that, yeah. that you and I came to even know each other? Yeah. Um, I just remember um, um, a good friend of ours, St Stefano, um, he, I was speaking to him on the phone and he, I had a question. Because he was a childhood friend of yours. Yes. And he was in, the Soledad, he was in the Soledad prison and they had both become Christians over the years. So they reconnected as friends. So right. she's on the phone with Stefano. And um, yes, and I had asked him a question. It was, I can't really remember the question, but um, I, it was, I know the answer was in the book of Ezekiel because Patrick had told it to me. And when he didn't have the answer and he waved, he happened to be, Patrick happened to be on the yard at the time and he waved him over and he asked um, him to get on the phone with me to answer my question. And not only did he, he knew the scripture, but he, he read what the scripture said and he didn't even have a Bible with him. And that, that was very impressive to me. Yeah, and then um, he was passing, Patrick was passing out these, uh, their spiritual messages, it's called the Whitt Whittle's Might. Right. And Stefan had sent one to me. And when I read it, it said something to the effect fact that Leah was not Leah was ugly and that um Leah and Leah was one of the wives of Jacob right back in the book of Genesis right but it mm -hmm. yeah okay. but it was basically yeah. saying that God can use people and uh, no matter whether they're you know whether she's ugly or whether that he stuttered or and I kind of felt that wasn't right because it said the author was unknown and I, I, I kind of felt that that wasn't right that he said that about a female so I mentioned that to Stefano and he brought that to Patrick. And so Patrick wrote on the back of that widow's mic, apologizing and, and how well, it was well, written. Well, let, let me see. Yeah. I didn't write the widow's mic. I distributed them. Somebody sent them right. into me. So I, I wrote on the back that I agree with you that it was wrong for the writer of this document, this paper to say that Leah was ugly. Right. So he wrote like a, Oh, the whole page was on the back of his writings and um, and it was like a letter. So I responded and then he responded to that letter and that's how it went. And then it went on to 
phone calls and then and then marriage. Uh, that's beautiful, man. God so good. Continue, guys. That's cool. I love these kind of stories. Yes, right. So yeah, that is how it came about. It was neither one of us were were on the search. It came about her, her asking her friend a question about the Bible that he didn't know the answer to. And I just happened to be walking by and um, was able to answer her question. So yeah, we began to write the phone calls. And as we're exchanging letters, she's living in Salt Lake City. Again, I need to emphasize that I, I didn't have the adult experience of a mature relationship with a grown up woman. You know, I, I was just a kid when I came in and I did my, I had done my YA time. It's just out of my range. So as, as our letters began to get more, you know, sharing emotions, getting to know each other, I'm starting to wonder if the Lord is doing something here, but I don't have a, much experience to draw from. I don't want to misread, you know, is there something going on here? So she came out to visit me on December 28th, 2000. 13. In fact, this is the picture right here. Our first picture together. Whoa, so, no way. Says, like a show, this is a great mystery. That's a quote from scripture. That awesome. A man and woman coming together in marriage is a great mystery. So on that visit, December 28, 2013, uh, we knew that God had arranged this. God had called us to come together and be husband and wife. Amen. Whoa. Wow. Did, did, um, when you guys were writing, Donna, did you, did you, um, did you have like early on feelings for him or when did you start to know that this could possibly be your husband? Do you know that when I was, uh, reconnected with my good friend, Stefano, um, I was already hungry. I was so hungry because I had given my life to the Lord in 2007 and I was really fired up and I'm as I am today. And, I was studying out the scriptures and I just wanted more and more, you know, to, to have a better understanding. And I was excited that uh, Stefano had a lot, he had a lot of not, he still does have a lot of knowledge about the word, but he couldn't answer that one question. And that's when Patrick went by, but in the letters that we were writing to each other, it just, I, I, I felt something in my heart that was, it was it was a joy of just knowing that how much he Patrick knows about the Lord and the scriptures and but it's not just like oh I'm just because somebody brought up the scriptures I'm 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 there I know that this was definitely from the Holy Spirit I I felt this with the core of the core of my heart that this was developing from the from from this is God's will yes and Patrick Paula when she says she was hungry. She means she was hungry for more knowledge of yeah. God's word, yeah. Christ. Yeah, right. yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and then um, Patrick. So, when did you start knowing? Like, like, man, how did you know? How did you both know? Like, you guys aren't making a mistake, and you know all that. That visit, Pablo. When I went out to the visit that morning, in the Soledad Central facility, for anybody who's been there. I lived on the wing closest to the yard. It's a long corridor down to the visiting room. And I was struggling with nervousness because like I said, this is this is out of my range of experiences here. I'm gonna spend the whole day with an adult Christian woman. I have no reference for that in my life to draw from. So the moment we sat down, I felt comfortable. And the whole day we had an open Bible right there. We just engaged one another in, in delightful conversation about who Jesus Christ is to us, getting to know each other. And then when the visit was over and as she was leaving and she was in the Sally port before exiting out through the door on her end, she turned around, looked back at me and just flashed this beautiful smile, says, bye, Patrick. <laughs> and it was so endearing to me. And I walked out of that visiting room just in amazement at what God has done. I'm 55 years old. I, it's not like women are beating down the door, trying to get to me. I don't have a paycheck. I don't know if I'm ever getting out of prison. I'm way past my prime. And here's this God-fearing, beautiful, delightful woman. And she's being drawn to me. It's certainly not because I got game. I don't have game. It, it was all I had to offer was Christ. 
And so I knew that this woman is God's gift to me. And that's what gave me the confidence. Yeah, man. See out there, guys. You guys are over there in the clubs and trying all the wrong places, man. Look to the Lord. He'll provide the best. I can attest. My, wo my, my, my woman is beautiful. I definitely married up. And this is cool, bro. This is the stories that I love to hear. Now, let me tell you this. Um, in my situation, obviously, there was a couple of people, you know, because of my past, didn't want her to marry me. Did you guys run into any of that before, you know? Because we know when God calls you together, you know, when God says that you are going to become one, nothing can separate, you know, don't separate, right? So was there any people coming saying, don't do this, you know, stuff like that? Well, my part, there was not. My family accepted him. Nice. They knew about him first, and they got to meet him and 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 hear how he speaks and hear his passion for Christ and his love for me, and they they accepted him right away. But Donna, at the time when when he was still in jail, you weren't you didn't even have the assurance that he was getting out, and, right. and that's what's cool because that's why you know I, that's why I know it's the Lord, but. Man, like, even with that, they accepted him, huh? Right. It's like, um, they. it wasn't like right away, but when they got to see that this was serious and that, um, you know, I made that commitment to make, to be one with him and, and how they saw the, the fired up, the, the more I'm sharing with them about God and what I'm learning and just, just saw the zeal in me and the fire in me that, an excitement of how much I'm learning and how much I'm sharing with them. And they were supporting me in my ministry with the homeless out there. They were, I, I just had a lot of support from them because they saw how much I'm growing. Wow. And I'm trying to get particular because, uh, man, we want to know everything about this. So, okay. So we're not going to get to the part yet. We're not going to get to the part yet where, where um, you guys finally get married before we get to that. I want to I want to tell ask you guys. Um, so, if there's somebody, especially like we get inmates watching, you know, inmates watching because they have cell phones now and stuff like that. Uh, and there's somebody maybe on the outside dating somebody, and they feel it's the Lord, or maybe even out here they feel that you know they're dating and they feel it's the Lord. Before we go on to the marriage, what advice can you give them, Patrick? To what advice can you give to people right now just considering that this person is or isn't, you know, for them? Right. I would advise, first of all, the woman from the outside that look for consistency in the guy you're interested in. Be sure that Jesus Christ is his first love and that he's not one of these people who's just having a jailhouse religious experience to the guy, I would say, just know this, no matter how well you think you can prepare yourself for being with her on the outside, it's not going to go the way you're expecting on a lot of different fronts. You're going to be in for surprises. Uh, it's it's just the way life works. Right. There's no possible way, especially if you're doing a long sentence, to really be prepared for this the intensity of a an, a responsible marriage relationship. And and to keep this in mind, once you're out there with her, she's not your celly. Uh, there's there's two imperfect people serving a perfect God. And from that part, I, I want to let my wife take over and, and mm -hmm. share what you would how what you would say, honey, to that. So the advice in those Christians dating, maybe if they're one's in jail, one's not, or or even out here on the streets, what advice would you give them before marriage? Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is, you know, having in the forefront of your mind going into a relationship. Is this going to be issues? There's always going to be issues because that's just how life works. Two imperfect people serving a perfect God. Yeah. But just to remember that marriage is a, com a, a covenant. And our ha happiness is, you know, it's important. But the most important thing is to honor the commitment, the, the covenant of marriage. Wow. 
That's it. Wow. I'd say that that really hits the, the nail on the head right there, that <clears throat> your your personal happiness with your your spouse, that is a big deal. But you can't let it be the most important value. The most important value is integrity, honor, wow. commitment uh, to know that marriage in the sight of God is a covenant pact. It's a it's a it's a covenant, a sacred covenant. Wow. And to honor that covenant at the end of the day has to be the most important and controlling value. Amen. You know, I, I got to say amen to that. Well spoken, Don and Patrick, man. That is so beautiful, man. And, and that's why I go by every day. You know, we made those, my wife and I made those covenants, covenant before God and it's before God. And I honor that so much. And because there's going to be times you're fighting, you don't get along and, you know, stuff like that. But you always come back that God calls us together. We're imperfect people, like you said, coming before a perfect God, like you said, is so beautiful, man. Well said. That's the Holy Spirit. But, uh, okay, I have one specific question for you, Patrick, but I'm going to wait till after we get to this. So tell us how you guys ended up getting married and uh, that whole thing, man. Okay, you go. You go. <laughs> okay. So before we had the formal legal ceremony, on November, in November of 2014, Donnelly visited me in April and we entered into, we made private vows before God, 2014. We, our reasoning was that we see so much divorce, even among church going people. And we didn't want our marriage to be founded upon somebody from the world saying, I pronounce you husband and wife. We know that we needed to go through that process and show our full respect for the orderliness of civilization. We, we would have a formal marriage ceremony with a certificate and all that, but we wanted it to be founded on something deeper. So we entered into the private vows. We confessed ourselves to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ as husband and wife. We read some verses such as, I think it's Psalm 56 says, my, my, the vows I make to you, O God, are binding upon me. And I enter into a vow of a marital commitment to be the husband of Donna Lee. She did the same to me. So in our understanding of reality, in the sight of God, we became husband and wife on that day, April 12th, 2014. Then Donna Lee in August had wrapped up her affairs in Salt Lake City, moved to Soledad. And on November 22nd, we had the civil ceremony. And I had said to the guy, uh, we paid him $200, right, to come in and do all what he had to do. And I said, when you're finished with what you need to do on your end, don't end it. And so what we did is after he did all he had to do, my best man. And for complicated reasons, Fred Mentor, my best friend, was not there. So my, my best man was Burt Cole. So he stepped in. And my sister Pam had a paper plate folded up with water in it. And Burt water baptized our marriage, uh, baptized this marriage in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the <laughs> Holy Spirit. <laughs> right. So that was the day. That, and, and our reasoning, again, was this, that, for example, after I paroled, when I was still in a halfway house in L.A., uh, Donnelly and I were walking down a street somewhere in Los Angeles, and we saw a sign. It said marriages, and right below it, it said divorces. <laughs> we thought, wow, you could pay a guy $200 to marry you today and go back and pay him $200 to divorce you tomorrow. So we wanted our marriage to be based on a deeper anchor, a deeper foundation, and that's how we went about doing it. Wow, man. Okay, so you guys get married. And then um, was, it, was that solid death prison? Yes. And then how long after did you um, get paroled? Four years. Four years, yes. Four years after? Yes. Four years after. And uh, really quick, man, um, tell us about that phone call when you called your wife about getting paroled. Yes, it was my eighth parole hearing. I had seven parole denials over a 23-year period. And when I was found suitable for parole, my first thought was, I can't wait to get out to the yard, 
call my beloved. So at that time, we had in our studies in the visiting room on weekends, we had really been focusing on the theme of the return of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm coming quickly. Yeah. So when I went out to the phone, as anybody who's been in the system or has made calls, received calls from someone in the system knows, the automatic voice machine will say to the person, you have a prepaid call from an inmate at a California correctional facility, but, and then it will leave us a, a couple seconds for the person to say his name. So in that couple seconds slot, I said, Jesus is coming soon. And so am I. <laughs> and she knew what that meant. So she pushed the number five, received the call and honey, tell them what it was like for you to hear those words. It was, I was just so overwhelmed with joy that I just couldn't even really talk much because I was crying. <laughs> I was crying just with so much joy in my heart that I knew that God was going to let him out. I always felt it from the, even though he explained to me before the beginning that there's a good chance he's never going to get it out. And I always knew that I was doing ministry and my ministry is, will still go on. And, but I always had it in the depths of my heart that God's perfect timing, he will release, he will release him. And um, I was just so excited I was just just the joy of knowing that God answered our prayer, not in our timing, but in his timing. If we could back up a couple of years to the denial in 2016. Okay, remember she moved to Soledad in 2014. And in 2016, there was a parole hearing. And I was bringing in more than 30 years straight clean time. So we thought just maybe this could be the one. And so... My beloved Donna Lee with my sister Pam was parked out in front of the Soledad prison as close as they could be. And they spent the whole morning worshiping. They knew my hearing was scheduled for, I think it was eight o'clock in the morning. So it was the worst hearing I ever had. It just went horrible. Three-year denial. So I had to go out to the yard, get in line, get on the phone. And I had to give her those words, honey, I got denied. Oh, yeah. It's just, a, just awful. Oh, just such an awful experience to have to bring her that. Um, like I said to you in our previous podcast, you know, all for all before Don Lee, God brought her into my life. I, I had just, I didn't think a whole lot about ever getting out. My rap sheet was so, so messed up. And I was just focused on Christ walking with him, ministry in the prison, whatever yard I was on. And I would get parole denials and it would just say, okay, that's how it goes. But now I have a wife. And so it's different. The whole situation has changed now. And there's a compelling drive. Lord, I cry out to you. Bring me to my wife. You've brought me this God-fearing, beautiful woman to be my wife. Bring me out of here, Lord. Open the door. So we thought that 2016 hearing might be it, but it wasn't. And she wrote, if I, if we could let her read just a paragraph from her from our book here, uh, Stories of Praise, where she tells this story. But honey, if you could give a, a little bit of backup, okay, where you, the day, it was a Friday that I had the hearing. And what, what she would often do is, even though she had a little one-room studio apartment, she would allow another woman to stay with her to save money on a on motel. You know, in a prison town, they, they jack up motel rates really bad on weekends, just part of the whole overall corruption. Right. And so so she would offer that. Well, it just so happened then this weekend there were two, right. two women with her. And she wanted really to be alone. She was in deep grief. But instead, she focused on entertaining uh, her guests and also on making sandwiches and sack lunches for her homeless ministry, which she would did up in Salinas in the Chinatown section of Salinas. And so here's how she tells it in, in this book, Stories of Praise. Um, she says, the night, the night after the, the parole denial, she said, as I struggled to fall asleep on the kitchen floor, because she let her guests sleep in her bed, I focused on worship through music. Over and over, I mentally sang two of my favorite songs. One is by Carrie Job and is entitled, I am not alone. In that song of adoring faith in Christ are the words, I am not alone, I am not alone. You will go before me, 
You Will Never Leave Me. The other song is Trust in You by Lauren Daigle right. with lyrics that go something like this. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. And then she goes on to explain how just through music, she drew on her faith in Christ. And the next day was a visiting day. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though, like, I would be praising God and just, you know, fulfilling my promise that I said, Lord, no matter what the outcome is, I'm going to praise you, glorify you, and thank you because I know what I ask for, you know what I need. I belong to you. You know what's best for your servant. So it goes according to your perfect timing. But I was praying that God would, you know, have mercy and and, and allow my husband to come home. So when that didn't happen, I just, I, I my flesh was, uh, became weak. But he says, when you're weak, you will become strong. And I cried out to him for that strength. And I, I was determined to do exactly what I promised God, even though my flesh wanted to be sorrowful. I said, be sorrowful all by yourself. I'm going to continue to pray, praise my God. So when I was making the sandwiches in the, in the kitchen, it's a very small kitchen, very small apartment altogether. And my guests were in the, in the, 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 what would you call that? The living room area and socializing. I was making the sandwiches and I could feel tears coming down my eyes, but I didn't want them to know my sorrow. So I kept, and then I, I would go back to, cause I had my, my little, my cell phone with the music playing. And I would just keep singing that song over and over in my mind and just worshiping and praising. And then once I was done and I was talking, you know, and then the sorrow will hit me again. I will just keep going right back. Into, it's like a seesaw. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emotionally. Just continue to praise God. So then the next day, Saturday in the visiting room, people will come to our table to offer their condolences. And what were you saying to them? I was telling them, thank you so much for your concern and your, 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 your love for us. And, and um, yes, it, it's hard, but what's, what pulls us through this is that knowing that this wasn't God's timing. And I don't want my timing. I don't want what God don't want me to have at this time. If this is not it, I want what God's perfect timing. So yes, it is a little sorrowful, but I'm rejoicing just the same because and now I have an opportunity to continue to cling to God and, and just waiting on him. And while I wait, we serve, we just continue to serve and that serving others, even though I was hurting, serving others is the best medicine for the soul. I kid you not. That is so cool, man. God's timing. I love it. That's what happened with me, too, and my wife. It was God's timing. If it wasn't my timing, I was just called to serve until then, you know, and even after. So, man, cool. So you guys so you guys are now married. You're released. Man, tell us about that first year of marriage on the outside. Like, how was that, guys? Because I know they say that the first year of marriage is the hardest, you know? is the roughest uh, how how was it man that that first day you got out and then uh, how how was that first year you want to start you go first okay <laughs> it's an accumulation of little things yeah. okay in the system as you know we get our routine uh, we have a certain way of doing things and so now to be uh, sharing a home um i set something down and, and there it is. Well, when I go back to get it, it's not there. It got moved. <laughs> you know, little stuff like that it accumulates. And in a prison, in prison, you don't move somebody else's stuff, right? You leave it there. <laughs> and so, you know, I I had to um, I had to learn to get over the little petty stuff, and and really just appreciate the awesomeness of my wife. I, oh, when I would be sleeping, if she would touch me, like to wake me up, it would startle me extremely. Uh, I'm not used to being touched when I'm sleeping. Or we're, one thing about prison, you're, you're safe in your cell. You're locked in there. You don't got to worry about burglars coming in the middle of the night or something. <laughs> so, right. so, and it would startle her. She says, wow, why did why does that freak you out when I wake you up? And, and I would try to explain it to her. Yeah. And so, you know, 
it's just the nature of life that two people living in close proximity and we're together a lot. We just get on each other's nerves sometimes. So we have to take a step back and, and just look at the bigger picture and realize all we have to be grateful for. So a lot of the first year was really just about that, just just growing up together. And getting to learn each other, just mm -hmm. learning each other's ways and just uh, knowing his weaknesses and his strengths and being always trying to be a, a very supportive, even when, you know, it's it could be, how do you say that word? When it could be uh, repetitive over and over, mm -hmm. the same thing, you know, just to be patient and understand because like he used to have night nightmares as well all the time and mm -hmm. wake up, you know, and I'd have to wake him up gently because he'd always be having like making these noises because he was having nightmares and he was always having being startled by certain, you know, so I had to be very supportive and patient with that, even though it was going on for you know a couple of years. But um, what uh, what I do appreciate is that I what we always have it at at our um, the top of my, our minds when we're going through issues. We know that God is the Potter, we're the clay, and He's molding it. He's molding us. He's using these issues to to strengthen us to to be prepared for anything in the future that could be way more than this. And I'm not talking about with just each other because we you must always remember that we're, we're not enemies to each other. What we're gonna face in the future when that great time comes, this is what he's preparing us for. for. So when we go through, we have a thorn in our side, but we're rubbing each other the wrong way. We know God is using that rub yes, and right. that thorn to strengthen us, to mold us, to perfect us, to present us without wrinkle and blemish for his name's sake and to prepare us for what's coming in the future. Yeah. And and I, and I love it because, you know, we can say, wow, why are we going through this? And I say, you know what? Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that we're experiencing this right now. Thank you that we can learn through this, that we're having this so we can learn to be better children mm -hmm. for your honor and your glory. Thank you. For wow. That. It's like James chapter one, man. We don't yeah. like the process, man, but it builds perseverance, you know, Good right. perseverance. And uh, man, I, it's it's I, I was going to ask you earlier, but you kind of got to it. Uh, Patrick, that you know, like in the cell, like uh, like I didn't do nearly as much time as you, you know, but um, still, I did long enough that I had my ways. You know, you put something down, you know, guys usually know where you put everything down, and you're gonna come back later, even if it's two days later. You want it to be in that same spot, you know. And uh, we have our ways, man, and and the institutions, man, we have our our way of eating, our food, the way we watch our back, the way we're in public, um, everything. So when we get married, our wives have to kind of like bear with us, you know, and thank God for God giving us loving, patient wives that uh, are willing to stick with us through all our muck and mire, man. What do you have to say, Patrick? Yeah, I would say that, again, we sometimes we got to in life, we just got to really take a step back and just look at the big picture. Um, I, I can look at my wife when she's sleeping and I, and I, I stare at her lovely face and my heart just melts. And I, oh. and I'm so aware of this is God's gift to me. And I, and I think of the times that, that I've let her down by showing a shortness of patience uh, and a, a wrong attitude, lack of gratitude, whatever it might be. And I, and I just feel such an adoring love for her. And it helps me to really get that, perspective and and so coming back to the the challenges that you have to expect it's just the nature of life in an imperfect world that every challenge we have conditioned ourselves to identify it as an opportunity for growth that god didn't just bring us together so we could grow old together and live happily ever after he brought us together for mission right um, our, our hearts are, are consumed with a passion to share the gospel with people, to share to a broken world that Jesus is the way. And we know that he has brought us together for that purpose. So sometimes when we're when we, we get a little worked up with each other, we have to remind each other, I'm here for you. I'm not against right. you. Right. No. I'm, I'm the one that when all the chips are down that you can count on. That's right. I know that her and she knows that about me amen i think that's really important donna touched on that too is that 
is that um you know you guys are on the same team that our partner is on the same team it's not our enemy that's the one that's our ride or die that's the one that's going to be there when everybody else forsakes us and we got to remember that out there all you married people that your wife your husband is not is not your enemy it's on your team looking out for your best and uh man before we get to what you guys are doing now i just have a simple question guys um what have you found so far is the key to a successful marriage for us it's always remembering again that our personal happiness with our spouse is a big deal but it cannot be the core anchoring value the supreme value is honor integrity and commitment to this sacred covenant relationship to honor god in my marriage right. whether i'm happy or not and, and i am happy there are times when i'm not but overall i'm very happy with my delightful wife but even if i wasn't that doesn't justify violating the sacredness of this covenant commitment what god has joined together let no one no man separate yeah. Amen. yes remembering we're two imperfect people serving a perfect god and that's yes. the the that's the most important thing to remember and and i would just like to say one thing if i may pablo about to um to people that are, are serving that are doing time in prison if you are blessed with a wife or you're blessed with somebody that's visiting you please don't please don't take that for granted whatever you're doing like if you're because for anyone that knows us from the soledad prison for four the whole four years i was there we were there every weekend that's what we were doing soaking up the word soaking up the word reading and having bible study and sharing it with other tables they would come over and ask us questions and what well, first can we get here and there but whatever we did in prison, we're doing it out here. It never stops. And don't, like when you come out, you get comfortable and you, you, you're not praying as much as you did when you were in prison. You're not reading and soaking up the word like you did when you were in prison. And you're not clinging to God like you used to when you were in prison. When you get out, there's so much opportunity, so much this and that. You, 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 the magnet of this world starts pulling you away from the things that was most important to you when you were in that cage. That is one thing you should never do when you come out. Keep that going. Keep that fire going. Don't don't let anything be more powerful to pull you away than having God's word pull you right where you're supposed to be. Because that is the, really the secret to everything, to be successful, Amen. is having wow. the love and fear for God. Okay, See that, Patrick? God gave you a godly wife, man, full of wisdom, bro. So cool, huh? Yeah, I, I'm just in a state of amazement always, and it never gets old. Um, yeah. I, I would like to say this also, that in the four years that we knew each other only in visiting rooms, that there were other couples in there. And one of the couples was Johnny and Cynthia Howe, who are, Johnny's been out, I think, about a year longer than me. They're doing well together, and it's just so nice to see because a lot of those visiting room relationships, they, they don't last. Uh, a majority of them don't last. And so if I can say this, you know, any of you guys who are watching from your phones in the system, if you're playing a woman, God's going to hold you accountable. You can't get away with it. He will hold you accountable. I've seen too many guys do it, and they, they pay the price because God's going to square all the books in the end. And I would I would add to that, man, just, uh, you know, having done enough years, I've only, I'm only if you add up all the years I've done, it adds up to about 13, right? Nothing compared to you, bro. But uh, I've seen enough visiting in the visiting room, and I've seen the guys come out to the yard and disrespect the people visiting them, you know, whether it be showing, you know, sharing pictures, talking down about them and using them. I agree, man. I agree. If you got something good, man, value, value that. That's the daughter of God, man. Um, don't, don't do that value who you got, man. And then speak up for them, speak positive of them okay. on the yard, you know, that people know that you're something different, man. And, uh, you know, keep private. What's private though. Don't share all the, all the guys, your private stuff too. But, mm -hmm. um, now 
Okay, so I want to get to, as we're almost closing, I want to get to what are you guys doing now? What's your ministry? What are you involved in? And, and all that, man. Please share. And then at the end of that, please share your, your the book. They got a book. They got a book, but we'll share that after. But the info is down there. If you guys want to know about the stories of praise, and it's going to be down there. But firstly, let's talk about, you know, what are you guys doing now? Like, what's your ministries and, and all that? Okay, our ministries at this time, we haven't reached our goal, which is to be positioned in life to do roadside ministries. Like, let's say there is a, a tornado in Kansas. We would get together our rapid response team and be out there, set up a roadside ministry, providing material needs to, to people and sharing with them the gospel. That's our dream to be full time ministry. Well, we haven't reached a position where we're able to do that yet. So what we do, uh, Don Lee is my assistant. Uh, we're a writing team. Uh, we spend a lot of time discussing the, the works that we're doing. We are involved with the church called ICCF, a bilingual church in San Diego. Um, I speak at different churches and events. We lead a Monday night, a Wednesday night Zoom Bible study. And that's pretty much what goes on with us where we look for opportunities to share with people. We do a lot of studying together ourselves in prayer. We're in continual communication with other Christians, but our dream, it, it, we, we're still waiting on the Lord for that to be full-time ministry. Right. And about those, um, I have these little cards. They have spiritual messages on them and they're, they're no bigger than about this size right here. What would you call that? Like yeah. A, a little card. spiritual message card. I have a message on it and then you put one on it. I put, um, I fold up like a, the dollar bill and I put them on, on top of them and put the tape to hold it on the card and mm -hmm. and I have to pass them out or just even drop a few um or like by the gas station or on, when I'm going shopping mm -hmm. and the dollar of course is going to grab somebody's attention but the message on the card is what I pray over all the cards praying that whoever receives one of the cards will uh, will be um You're right inspired to want to think more about the Lord or possibly even give their lives to the Lord. That's yeah. God's word does not go out void. Right. Right. And uh, here would be an example of things that Donna Lee does. She was, we went one night to a nearby city for her to be interviewed for a babysitting job. And the young couple, they had two or three children and they identified as Christian and they were not married. And as we're talking to them, they wanted, needed to get to know her. And before we left, she says, I need to tell you that you're going to a marriage counselor and you're raising three children who you want to grow up to be good, successful people. And she told them, she said, she looked at the man in the eye. She said, you need to show respect for God's daughter and put a ring on her finger. She didn't get the job. But she told them what they needed to hear. Right. So, and when I ahead. said it, I, I didn't say it like with, I, I said it with love and mm -hmm. humility. I promise. I said it because I knew the guy because I he works at the post office. And I'm always at the post office mailing out packages to my grandkids or whatever I'm doing. And um, he said that his wife, you know, they, they need a date night and stuff like that. And I was assuming it was his wife. And so, um, and, and I said, well, my husband and I, we, we'll babysit, you know, I'll have an opportunity to share a little bit to, to the babies about the Lord. And they were fired up for that. So he invited us to his house and I had no idea I was going to say that. I didn't, it just came out. So I know it was the Holy Spirit. I, I was going there for one thing, but the Holy, but I know our heavenly father let our, our pastor meet so I can relate that message to him. And, and a big part of her ministry, Pablo, is her job. Uh, for, tell, tell them what you do for a living. Well, I do I do home care. I, I care for elderly people, mm -hmm. and I, I I look for that as a as like my perfect opportunity to share about the Lord with them. And and um, it goes I, way beyond the call of duty. Just this morning, maybe two hours ago, one of her clients, uh, an elderly woman, called and uh, said in her broken English, they're they're from uh, the Far East. Uh, 
a toilet, no water and toilet. And uh, she was, she, she, she walked <laughs> her through to it, it explained it. They, it. they develop a trust in her and it goes beyond just her, what she's getting paid for. So that's a big part of her ministry. Right. That's cool. That's cool, man. It's so cool. And um, I lied. I have one more question before we get to the book. I want to close off with the book. Patrick, what's the importance of having brothers or sisters in Christ? I know you're a good friend of Fred. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and um, why do we need to have brothers and sisters in Christ around this man or, you know, accountable to? Yeah, it's the way that God has structured reality so that we cannot have reach our maximum potential in isolation. He has designed it so that we can only know Mac in a maximum way. We can only experience Jesus Christ in a fellowship of Christians through one another. Christ will withhold much of himself from a person who tries to go it alone got to be connected with the body Amen. Yeah. so cool so cool man and in closing man share with us your book and what it's about and how did they get it man we want to really uh push that book because we know it could edify you and help you out there and i encourage everybody out there get a copy of this book yeah the stories of praise you see the if you can see it the design there's a crown of thorns and there's hands lifted up. So it's the role of praise in the walk of faith. It's a series of eight compact Bible studies, which show from the Bible how important praise is to God and how God works through praise as a bold expression of faith. But each chapter also has a three to five page short true story, some from my life, some from Donna Lee's life and some from our good friend, Fred Mendron's life. And so the book aims to show through contemporary living experience and biblical history and teaching that when we are confronted with really hard times in our lives, these hard times eventually are going to pass. But what we keep is how we responded to those situations. That's what holds its value. And so even with tears on our face and on our fingertips, offer up praise and thanksgiving to God, even just for the fact that we can pray to him at all. And, and um, so that's what we call it stories of praise. It's it was written originally in 2007. Uh, Fred Mendron and some others raised up some money and hired an attorney who believed he could get me out on a writ of habeas corpus. He did the writ. He came to visit me on my 50th birthday, handed me the writ and said, this is a slam dunk. You're going to be out of here within a year on an unconditional release. So for about four months, I walked around the prison with this tickly feeling in my stomach that, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be out of here within a year. Um, my, my family's going to be able to see what Christ has done for me. I'm going to be able to sit on a porch with my father because I'd already lost my mother. And so four months after four months of this, I went out to the yard one night in December of 2007. It was a very cold night. So there were a few inmates on the yard and I called my sister Pam to get an update from Fred, from the attorney on if anything has happened on the writ, because we we're supposed to have a hearing. Well, there were four words that Pam relayed to me from Fred. The writ was denied. And so for four months, I had been assuming I'm getting out within a year. This is a slam dunk, the attorney said. So for me, it was like being in an airplane on a beautiful summer day and you don't see the mountain. In one second, the whole thing shattered. And, and the devastation was not so much for me, but for what my family is going to. They were so excited. It's almost like having done a life. I'd already done uh, almost 25 years. And it was almost like having done a life since. And now I'm starting over. So I walked out to the middle of the yard. Very few guys were out there, as I said. And I looked up at the sky. And as you know, in, in a prison, you don't see stars because of all the lights. And it's just a total dark sky. And I remember saying something like, Father, I don't see any stars, but I know they're there. And then I looked around the prison at, at the, how the lights from the, the gun towers, how they bounce off the razor wire. And I saw an inmate walking in front of a tower and with his hands in his pockets. And I could see the 
steam coming out of his mouth because it was such a cold night. And I just looked around and I, and I thought, everything I see is ugly. But I know that if God peeled open the air right now, I could see heaven watching. The battle's on. Not going to give up. So I went back to my cell and praise God, I had a single cell and uh, went in at the unlock and I started pacing and I was struggling for a while. I just think I, I, I really don't know what to do, Lord. This, this what my family's going to have to go through. I'm just not sure what to do. I feel like I'm pinned to a corner. What am I to do? And we're walking back and forth. And I don't know how long that went on, but all of a sudden, three verses from First Thessalonians chapter 5 just rolled into my mind. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I just stopped. Those words took hold of my mind, and I said, I know what I've got to do now. So I got down on my knees between the toilet and my locker facing the wall, and I said, Father, I thank you for all you're going to do through this denial of this writ. Thank you for all you're going to accomplish in my life through this painful experience. And that was a spiritual breakthrough for me. Uh, over the next month, I went, took my Strong's Concordance, and I found every single verse in the Bible that uses words like joy, praise, thanksgiving. And I began packaging them into sections, which became chapters of a book. And then that's how we ended up with the book, Stories of Praise. So that's a little bit of the history behind it there. That's cool. I wish I could. I wish I could have had read this book when I was first starting out my sentence. Cool, man. Is it available on audio book too? No, it's not. Man, you got to get an audio book, bro. <laughs> I don't know how it's done. I'm just saying, man. A lot easier said than done, huh? <laughs> yeah, things cost. You know. Yeah, but uh, that would be cool, man. People, because I have a bunch of friends. You know, a lot of people are readers nowadays. You know. I am, but a lot of people like to drive and listen to audio books and stuff, yeah. man. Another way to ministry. But, um, man, that book's going to be down there, man. And in closing, do you guys have anything else you want to share with everybody before we close out? Okay. Anything, maybe? okay. Yeah, I, I just want to say again that, you know, always remember in a marriage relationship, the, the main value has to be honor, honoring Christ that bring Jesus into everything, everything and every challenging experience, even if it's a daily thing, trust God that he's using this as an instrument to build you up. And integrity is more important than emotional happiness. Mm -hmm. Cause at the end of the day, what you get to keep forever is integrity, not your emotional happiness. Amen. And what we long to hear at the end of the human Christ returns, well done, uh, my good, good and faithful, faithful servant. servant. <laughs> we don't yeah. want to hear those words. Get behind me. I never knew you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. So the way that can be heard is continue to fight the good fight. Continue yes. to wear the full armor of God. Continue to go forward following Christ Jesus with joy in our hearts. Whether our flesh wants to feel the joy or not, you feel it spiritually, exercising it, showing God that against all odds, odds, we're going to continue to serve you and keep our focus on you. In Jesus' yeah, name, man. amen. 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 And, and to you out there, man, uh, maybe you're, this is all Greek to you. I just want to say, man, um, the Bible says if you confess in your heart and believe, or believe in your heart, and how does it go? For, how does it go, Patrick? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ. died for our sins, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall will be saved. saved. Right. Just call out to him today, man. Call out to him today. And uh, man, he'll he'll come into your life. He'll come into your heart. He'll change your life. Um, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but uh, you get in, you start reading your word. You find a good church, man, and, and get around a bunch of believers. Do it today. I know you've thought about it out there. Don't lie to me, guys. People <laughs> want you thought about it. Today's the day of salvation. Right. right. I'm not willing. God's not willing that anybody should perish, but all should come to repentance. He died on the cross. Amen. So we can have eternal life with them, guys. So, you know, today's the day to call on him. For all you people out there struggling in marriage, I hope you were uh, uh, or, or thinking about marriage. I hope you were encouraged. And for those of you single, I pray that today you would just wait on him. Wait as right. God's, God's timing is perfect, like, like Donna and Patrick said, man. So I just want to thank you guys today. 
again, man. And uh, it's been beautiful, man. Thank you so much, Patrick and Donna. Thank you for having us. God yes. bless you, Pablo. All right. This is LA Times signing out. God bless you all. Take care. Keep watching. Keep looking. We have good stuff coming. Amen.